A little over a decade ago, Sherry Sanji lost her life in one of the most famous and tragic academic lab accidents. Her death has highlighted many of the safety issues that can arise in academic research labs and has stimulated a push towards increased safety awareness in academia. Sherry's death was caused by the organic metallic compound T-butyllithium. T-butyllithium reacts with the moisture and oxygen in the air in a highly exothermic reaction. Sherry's sample of T-butyllithium was inadvertently exposed to air, which then immediately ignited, catching her clothes on fire, ultimately leading to the burns and then her death. Her tragic death could have been prevented had she been wearing proper uh, protective equipment and had she been properly trained before working with such a dangerous chemical. This case highlights the dangers that we see in organic chemistry, particularly with highly reactive compounds such as our organometallic compounds. While these safety issues remain, we do still work with our organometallic compounds because of their high reactivity, which enables us to create a wide number of different compounds using the reactions of our organometallic compounds. Now, while these can be highly reactive, they can also be very useful in nature as well. Um, so many of our, our natural compounds in our body actually contain organometallic com components as well. Um, so they're not always dangerous and highly reactive, uh, but they can be uh, depending on what the structure of that compound looks like. Organometallic compounds are compounds that contain carbon to metal covalent bonds. So we can have a metal such as lithium bonded to a carbon, or something like magnesium bonded to a carbon. Compounds that contain metal to carbon ionic bonds, such as our alkyne anions, are typically excluded uh, because they, of course, aren't covalent bonds. Right? So we wouldn't consider these uh, ionic based compounds as part of our organometallic compound class. As with our other functional groups, we're going to take a look at the naming, properties, and reactivity of our organometallic compounds. Let's start by looking at the naming of our organometallic compounds. So any organometallic compound has two or maybe three different key components. We have the carbon portion, right? So it's just our, our single carbon here, or our three carbons down here. We have our metal, lithium or magnesium, and then we may also have a more non, a more electronegative non-metal, such as our, our halogen shown here. So we're going to need a separate naming component for each of these. Uh, so first for our carbon chain, we're going to name this as an alkyl branch. So we have our alkyl branch. So in this case, this would be a methyl branch. Or down here, we have a propyl branch. Now, after that, we're going to put the name of our metal. So name our metal. Uh, so we have lithium or magnesium. So we have methyl lithium or propyl magnesium to indicate that metal there in our organometallic compound. At this point, our lithium compound is complete. Right? We have methyl lithium describing the full structure of our organometallic compound. And of course, we can use that for larger organolithium compounds as well. Right? So we could have our structure down here with our lithium attached. So we have our alkyl group. This is a cyclohexyl group. And we have that lithium there. So this would be cyclohexyl lithium. Up here with our magnesium-based compound, we have our third component that we need to add in here as well. So we had our alkyl branch, our metal, and now we have our halogen here, which we're going to name as an anion. So we name this as if it's an anion. Um, so that means we add in our IDE ending. So this is going to be propyl magnesium, and we have bromine here. So this is propyl magnesium 
bromine. So just add our, our two or three components together, and we can get our full names for our organometallic compounds. Now let's take a closer look at the properties and reactivity of these organometallic compounds. So again, as I mentioned before, our organometallic compounds actually involve covalent bonds between our carbon and our, these metals. Now we're typically used to seeing metals only use ionic bonds and non-metals like carbon only use covalent bonds. This bond here is actually partially between ionic and covalent. Right, really, ionic versus covalent is a, a sliding scale. We have purely covalent on one end, purely ionic on the other end, and then ranges of combinations of polar covalent and ionic in the middle. Right, so as that electronegativity difference between our atoms becomes very large, it eventually becomes purely ionic, where they just the more electronegative atom just takes all those electrons. In the case of our carbon in our metal, Carbon is less electronegative than something like oxygen, so even though our metals are very non-electronegative, they do have somewhat of a covalent bond between our carbon and our metal. Right? So this bond is going to be strongly polarized towards our carbon, almost to the extent of being ionic. Right? So our carbon has a very large partial negative charge, and our metal has a very large partial positive charge but it still does have some uh, covalent characteristics as well, right? So we can still draw it as a covalent bond, even though most of those electrons are going to be sitting on our carbon, right? So in this case, we have a strongly nucleophilic carbon, and of course, our metal is going to be strongly electrophilic. So our highly polarized bond here enables our carbon to act as this highly reactive nucleophile. In fact, we can almost treat these compounds as carbanions. Right? Our carbon gets such a large share of those electrons that it behaves very similar to a carbanion with that then strong basicity and nucleophilicity associated with the negative charge sitting on that less electronegative carbon. Right? So if we look at our covalent form of this versus our ionic form, right? It does have some covalent characteristics, but for reactivity purposes, we can almost just look at it as that anion. So how do we form these highly unstable and reactive organometallic compounds? To do this, we're going to combine alkyl halides with our metal, which will then allow them to react through a single electron transfer reaction to form our desired organometallic compound. Let's look at the example of our bromoethane reacting with lithium. Lithium, of course, is in the first column of the periodic table, which means that it has a single valence electron. Uh, it wants to give away that valence electron in order to have uh, the full octet of uh, our full outer electron layer. Um, so we're going to give our single electron over to our carbon-based compound, and of course, when we do this, we form a radical anion. So our carbon structure takes that extra electron, which of course has a negative charge because it is an electron. Now, of course, the question here is where do we put this extra electron and negative charge? Initially, right, there's no real clear way to put that extra electron. Now, of course, bromine really likes getting extra electrons. It's more electronegative. It's close to getting that full octet. So our bromine actually wants to break off. Um, so it will take its electrons and leave. And then we can bring this radical electron in to our carbon to help replace some of those lost electrons. So we bring in that, that radical electron, and we end up creating our alkyl radical. and our bromide anion. Now at this point we can bring in a second unit of lithium 
And we can do another single electron transfer and combine it with our alkyl radical to form our organolithium product. Right, so we get our, our ethyl lithium, where our two carbons have now bonded to our lithium. We had one lithium atom that now becomes a lithium cation after it donated that single electron, and the second one ends up bonded in our organolithium compound. So we have both a lithium cation and a bromide anion that can form an ionic compound in addition to our organotelic ethyl lithium compound. The reaction of our alkyl halide with magnesium looks very similar to the reaction with lithium, with the exception that our magnesium has two electrons that it can donate to our alkyl halide. So we're going to take our, our first electron and we're going to send that over to our alkyl halide with that single electron transfer. Again, we end up with a radical anion forming with that extra electron. In this case, we get a magnesium cation that still has one free valence electron. Our bromine ends up taking the electrons while the single electron goes to the carbon to give us our alkyl radical. Our alkyl radical can then combine with our magnesium to create our organometallic compound. Now, of course, our magnesium still has a positive charge after it bonds to our, our carbon here, whereas our bromide ion has a negative charge. So our bromide ion will actually associate with our magnesium ion to create our final organometallic compound. with that magnesium and that bromide here combined. So this becomes our ethyl magnesium bromide. Uh, these sorts of compounds here are also called uh, Grignard reagents. Uh, so you can call them either uh, organomagnesium compounds or Grignard reagents. Again, of course, these bonds are semi-covalent, but also mostly ionic. The bond between magnesium and bromide, of course, would be even more ionic compared to the bond between our magnesium and our carbon here. Um, but it still has some of that covalent characteristic that, of course, is what makes it an organometallic compound. So as we see here, the formation of our organometallic compounds is actually quite simple. We just need that alkyl halide combined with our, our metal, whether it's lithium or magnesium, or we can also use other metals as well, although that can be a little bit more complicated. Our metal will donate its elect extra electrons in, and we end up forming that semi-ionic, semi-covalent bond with our carbon. Our carbon then is highly reactive because it acts essentially as a carbanion and can then attack a variety of other compounds. That high reactive Activity is both a benefit because it can allow us to make some new reactions, but it's also a liability because of the dangerous reactions that can be associated with that. Right? Highly reactive is also highly dangerous, whereas lower reactivity makes it less dangerous because there's less possibilities for, for how that can react. Uh, that's one of the, the dualities that we always see with chemistry. In our next video, we'll take a closer look at these different reactions and see how we can use this to create a range of new compounds in the lab.